While perhaps not the oldest profession, accounts of midwives go back to at least ancient Egypt, where records have been found detailing various gynecological processes, prognosis for newborns, and even birthing chair designs. Since those earliest times, midwives have been connected not just to birth, but to birth control, with written records describing methods found on papyrus dating from as early as 1550 BCE. These practices also existed in ancient Greece, where scholars such as Plato wrote of midwives using herbal treatments to end pregnancy. The abortifacent penny royal tea was apparently so commonly known among the general public that at least one Greek playwright used it as a comedic reference as early as 421 BCE. Another herb that was used both as a contraceptive and as a seasoning was called sophilium. It was documented as being the favorite import from the northern African city of Cyrene to both the Greeks and to Romans. It was so important as an expert that Cyrene used the plant on their coins prior to it likely being farmed to extinction. Records from ancient Rome were even more specific, not just in terms of references, but in providing complete recipes for various abortifications used at the time. Documents from Greece and Rome also make clear that midwifery was viewed as a very highly skilled trade. Second century Greek physician Serranus of Ephesus wrote the following describing a good midwife. Quote, a suitable person will be literate, with her wits about her, possessed of a good memory, loving work, respectable, and generally not unduly handicapped as regard to her senses, i.e. sight, smell, and hearing, sound of limb, robust, and according to some people, endowed with long, slim fingers and short nails at her fingertips. Records indicated that there were at least three levels of classification for a midwife. The first was largely self-trained. The second had read and studied texts on obstetrics and gynecology and had some knowledge of both herbal contraceptives and abortifications. And the third was considered a highly skilled and highly trained medical specialist. Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder cited Greek midwife Salpe of Lemnos numerous times, not just in relation to obstetrics or, quote, woman's diseases, but also for treatment of a number of other ailments, such as sunburns, stiff, numb limbs, and dog bites. Some records from antiquity also reference surgical examples of ending pregnancies, but this seemed secondary to herbal or even physical methods such as binding of the stomach. Early Christian scholar Hippolytus of Rome wrote this binding was done, quote, to expel what was being conceived. This is not to say that contraception and use of abortifications were not questioned or criticized. Early Christian scholar Tertullian argued in his work A Treatise on the Soul that contraception was sinful as he believed life began at conception. Tertullian also argued that sex, even within marriage, was a disruption to the Christian life. He believed those who abstained from any sexual activity deserved more power in the church as sexual relations of any kind were a barrier to a close relationship with God. Tertullian advocated for virgin girls to wear a veil, and he wrote of Eve, quote, Do you not know that you are Eve? The judgment of God upon this sex lives on in this age. Therefore, necessarily, the guilt should live on also. You are the gateway of the devil. You are the one who unseals the curse of that tree, and you are the first one to turn your back on the divine law. You are the one who persuaded him, whom the devil is not capable of corrupting. You easily destroyed the image of God, Adam. Because of what you deserve, that is death, even the Son of God had to die. St. Jerome also condemned birth control of any kind, arguing celibacy, ideally virginity, was the most noble path. He wrote the following advice to a father of a young woman, quote, When you go on a short way into the country, do not leave your daughter behind you. Leave her no power or capacity of living without you, and let her feel frightened when she's left to herself. Let her not converse with the people of the world or associate with the virgins indifferent to their vows. Let her not be present at the weddings of your slaves, and let her take no part in the noisy games of the household. As regards the use of the bath, I know that some are content with saying a Christian virgin should not bathe along with the eunuchs or with the married women, with the former because they are still men, at all events in mind, and with the latter because women with child offer a revolting spectacle. For myself, however, I wholly disapprove of baths for virgin of full age. Such a one should blush and feel overcome at the idea of seeing herself undressed. By vigils and fast, she mortifies her body and brings it into subjection. By a cold chastity, she seeks to put out the flame of lust and to quench the hot desires of youth. And by a deliberate squalor, she makes haste to spoil her natural good looks. Why, then, should she add fuel to a sleeping fire by taking baths? St. Jerome also disliked marriage. Writing to a woman contemplating a second marriage, he said, quote, You've already learned the miseries of marriage. It's like unwholesome food, and now that you've relieved your heaving stomach of its bile, why should you return to you again like a dog to vomit? Both Tertullian and St. Jerome were influential scholars in shaping Catholic doctrine that condemned contraception, but adopting their views on universal celibacy was no way for a successful religion to grow. Around 370 A.D., a young St. Augustine went to a bathhouse with his father. 
His father commented on his, quote, inquietus adolescia, or restless young manhood. Depending on the translation, this was either a reference to his having an erection due to what he saw in the bathhouse, or his father noticing he'd grown pubic hair. Either way, his father was apparently overjoyed with what he saw, and told Augustine's mother that his son was becoming a man, and therefore he would one day become a grandfather. St. Augustine's mother, who would later be known as St. Monica, did not share his father's joy. Augustine wrote, she, quote, endured violent spasms of reverent, tremulous trepidation at the idea of his sexual maturity. She had converted to Christianity, and her views on her son's budding sexuality were likely around concerns that he would follow in his father's adulterous habits. All of this was detailed in St. Augustine's 13-book work entitled Confession, which was written as if speaking to God directly. Augustine wrote his mother fought with his father, quote, to ensure that you, my God, were my father rather than him. His mother's concern seemed to have been warranted. Following his father's death when he was 17 years old, Augustine wrote of his premarital sexual encounters while traveling around Carthage and Rome as a teenager and young adult, including the fathering of a child out of wedlock. He wrote of these experiences with a deep regret and discussed how he became a Catholic and embraced celibacy in his understanding of the faith. Augustine seemed to be particularly bothered by how involuntary lust was. He wrote, quote, well then, how significant is the fact that the eyes, and lips, and tongue, and hands, and feet, and the bending of back, and neck, and sides are all placed within our power, to be applied to such operations as are suitable to them, when we have a body free from impediments and in sound state of health. But when it must come to a man's great function of the procreation of children, the members which are expressly created for this purpose will not obey the direction of will, but lust has to be waited for to set these members in motion, as if it had legal right over them. And sometimes it refuses to act when the mind wills, while often it acts against its will. Must not this bring the blush of shame over the freedom of human will, that by its contempt of God, its own commander, it has lost all proper command for itself over its own members? Augustine viewed sexual arousal as inescapable, writing, quote, Very movements which it causes in our sorrow, even in sleep and even in the bodies of chaste men. Unlike Jerome and Tertullian, Augustine argued that sex was not a sin if it was specifically for the purpose of procreation, but otherwise it was a sin of lust as it averts one's attention away from God. Through all of these contemplations and writings, he formulated what became to be known as the doctrine of original sin, which argued man was born a sinner and needed to be redeemed. He argued Jesus was without sin because unlike all other people, in his case, quote, holy virginity became pregnant, not by conjugal intercourse, but by faith. Lust being utterly absent, so that that which was born from the root of first man might derive only the origin of race, but also of guilt. A century of debate around Augustine's interpretation followed, as other scholars, such as Pelagius, believed that people must be born pure and make a choice to sin. They rejected the idea of original sin as they refused to believe God could be so cruel as to condemn those who had no chance to repent, such as infants or children, to eternal damnation by being born with sin outside of their own actions and decisions. Pelagius specifically argued that rather than being born with sin, each person was given by God free will upon birth to make the decision to sin or to follow God's teachings. Therefore, he argued, people were personally accountable and no church actions around confession or absolution could save someone from a decision to sin. Pelagius' argument for the removal of the church's ability to redeem brought him into conflict with the church which granted absolution, and also from lay folk who were prone to sin and wanted a way to be forgiven. Pelagius was condemned by the Catholic Church starting in 418 AD, and by 529, Augustine's view had largely won out. Pelagius' teachings were deemed heretical, and much of his writing has been lost as a result, while much of Augustine's teachings have become a formal Catholic Church doctrine during the Second Council of Orange. To help mitigate the concerns Pelagius and his followers raised with regards to children and infants being born with sin, baptism into the Church for infants became canon law. Sometime between 1227 and 1234, Pope Gregory IX declared that procreation was essential for marriage and that entering into any kind of intentionally childless marriage was against the teachings of the Church. This would include using contraceptive of any kind. However, it seems by most accounts that throughout this time, midwives and women did as they always had with regards to birth control, perhaps just with a little bit more secrecy to keep it from the Church. Traditions tended to develop in many cultures which would actively exclude men from the processes around childbirth. Sometimes these traditions even expanded into law. One example of this comes from a Belgian historian writing for a fine for a man, quote, named one Henny Van Dam for having hid behind a staircase to eavesdrop upon his wife, she being in labor of childbirth, 
which thing doth not befit a man, for the said eavesdropping was fined fifteen livers. In the mid-1400s, with the invention of the printing press, formal education began to spread. Universities began to emerge, many of which were seeking to specialize in areas like medicine, and these eventually led to licensing requirements in order to practice medicine. But women were excluded from being able to attend these schools, and also therefore excluded from the licensing process. Surgery and barbering had historically been paired professions because of the shared tools, and it's likely not a coincidence that church records show that many midwives were married to men of these professions, having either shared knowledge of medicine generally, or the practical reality that this time a woman seeking to practice medicine needed a male business partner because of the legal restrictions now being put upon them. It was also around this time that witch trials began to be normalized throughout Europe. Midwives and other medical practitioners were particularly vulnerable to accusations because herbal treatments could be viewed as magical in nature, and because failures to heal could be viewed as malicious or intentional. In 1484, Pope Innocent VIII issued a papal bull stating that witches were known to have, quote, slain infants yet in the mother's wombs. He also went on to indicate that they were engaging in actions that were, quote, hindering men from performing the sexual act and women from conceiving. This papal bull was used as an introduction to a book cited by witch hunters titled Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of the Witches. The book specifically targeted midwives and their use of contraceptions and abortifications, writing, quote, here is set forth the truth concerning four horrible crimes which devils commit against infants, both in the mother's womb and afterwards. And since the devils do these things through the medium of women and not men, this form of homicide is associated rather with women than with men, and the following are the methods by which it is done. The canonists treat more fully than the theologians of the obstructions due to witchcraft, and they say that it is witchcraft not only when anyone is unable to perform the carnal act of which we have spoken above, but also when a woman is prevented from conceiving, or is made to miscarry after she is conceived. A third and fourth method of witchcraft is when they have failed to procure an abortion, and then devour the child or offer it to the devil. In 1558, Pope Sixtus V issued a papal bull declaring contraceptives to be equivalent to homicide. His order for that level of punishment was largely ignored, and the next pope repealed most of the sanctions three years later, but not the statement of equivalence. The Catholic position in opposition to birth control was not one of the issues of separation during the Protestant Reformation. All major Protestant denominations shared more or less the same view that birth control was against the teaching of the Church, if not specifically a sin. But of course, even with attacks on contraception, people were still having sex, very often breaking other Church teachings by having sex outside of marriage. Based on Church records going back to at least 1580, using comparisons of baptism and marriage records, specifically when these two events were less than eight and a half months apart, Premarital pregnancy is estimated to be as high as 30%. This was true even in Puritan New England, where one of the most detailed records that has survived was from a midwife by the name of Martha Ballard. Starting in 1785, Martha kept a journal of her daily life, including the records of her work, and during this time she delivered over 800 children and attended more than 1,000 births. According to her records, more than a third of these were the result of premarital or extramarital sex. One particularly awkward example for Martha was when one woman she was assisting with giving birth, quote, declared my son Jonathan was the father of the child. Martha's son John married the woman four months later. And despite any condemnations of the church, many were still using contraceptives as abortifications. Midwives are the primary source of knowledge and access to these things, having long traditions passed down using herbal abortifications such as pennyroyal tea, or even more toxic options such as turpentine. So well-known and common was turpentine that some slave owners changed the recipe to make it less vile as a horse in order to force enslaved women to give birth, as the children would be property of the slave owner by law. A former slave was quoted as saying of the practice, quote, In them days the turpentine was strong, and ten or twelve drops would miscarry you. But the makers found that what it was used for, and they changed the way of making turpentine. It ain't no good no more. Recipes for abortifacents began appearing not just in medical journals, but in books discussing everyday home remedies, even ones written for men. In 1699, a book entitled Young Man's Companion contained an incorrect recipe for an abortifacent. In 1734, a pamphlet entitled Every Man is His Own Doctor contained a recipe for, quote, the suppression of courses. This recipe was then republished in 1748 by Ben Franklin. It stated, quote, For this misfortune, you must purge with Highland flag, commonly called bellyache root, a week before you expect to be out of order, and repeat the same two days after. The next morning drink a quarter of a pint of pennyroyal water, or decoction, with twelve drops of spirit of hartshorn, and as much again as night when you go to bed. Continue this nine days running, and after resting three days, go on with it for nine more.
By the early 1800s, in many places, certification laws began to be written more aggressively, requiring those providing medical services of any kind, including those traditionally provided by midwives, such as birthing, attend medical schools and colleges. But of course, women who had the most knowledge of obstetrics and gynecology were not allowed to attend, let alone teach at these colleges and medical schools. As a result, training in these early medical schools with regards to women's health often led to far worse care than was provided by an experienced midwife. One example occurred in 1846 when a Hungarian physician named Ignaz Semmelweis noted that more women were dying in maternity wards staffed by men than by women. He traced these deaths to the male students not properly washing their hands after examining cadavers. Even with the new laws around certification in many areas, midwife services, including birth control, remained in high demand. In 1839, an advertisement ran in the New York Sun stating, quote, To married women, Is it not but too well known that the families of the married often increase beyond what the happiness of those who give them birth would dictate? Is it moral for parents to increase their families regardless of consequences to themselves or the well-being of their offspring when a simple, easy, healthy, and certain remedy is within our control? The advertiser, feeling the importance of the subject and estimating the vast benefit resulting to thousands by the adoption of means prescribed to her, has opened an office where married females can obtain the desired information. The advertisement was for the services of a midwife named Ann Lohman, who went under the pseudonym Madame Restell. She would serve patients at her clinic on Greenwich Street in New York City from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., and those who couldn't come in person, she would provide mail order services, sending products such as preventative powder and female monthly pills. These products were more or less variations of the same herbal treatments midwives have been providing women for centuries. She would also provide surgical abortions on a sliding scale depending on the woman's income, and ran a boarding house where women who could give birth anonymously, and she would also facilitate adoption services to these women for a fee. These services were in such demand and price competition so intense that her advertisements often included things like beware of imitators. And despite any objections to the Catholic Church, all of this was legal in New York, so long as everything occurred before what was known as the quickening. The quickening was the moment when the woman could first feel the child move, generally around the fourth month of pregnancy. It was the understanding of the time that this was when the soul entered the body. In 1840, controversy arose when one of her patients, Maria Purdy, died. The death was likely due to tuberculosis, but her husband blamed Ristel and went to police, alleging Ristel was, quote, administering to Purdy certain noxious medicine, and, quote, procuring her miscarriage by the use of instruments, the same not being necessary to preserve her life. Ristel defended herself both in court and in the press. She ran an ad in the New York Herald which read, quote, I cannot conceive how men who are husbands, brothers, or fathers can give utterance to an idea so intrinsically base and infamous that their wives, their sisters, or their daughters want but the opportunity and the facility to be vicious. And if they are not so... It is not from an innate principle of virtue, but from fear. What is female virtue, then? A mere thing of circumstance and occasion? She was initially found guilty at trial, but the verdict was overturned on appeal. And she not only continued providing services, but expanded, opening offices in Boston and Philadelphia, and advertising services for, quote, married ladies whose delicate or precarious health forbids a too rapid increase of family. Anti-abortion advocates of the time called her, quote, the monster in human shape and said she was a threat to the institution of marriage as she allowed women to, quote, commit as many adulteries as there are hours in the year without the possibility of detection. In 1845, the New York State Legislature passed a bill that made providing abortions or abortifacants at any stage of pregnancy a misdemeanor, with a mandatory year in prison. Women seeking the service would be fined $1,000 or the equivalent of around $40,000 in today's numbers. Despite this law, for two years she still managed to avoid legal troubles, until one of her patients went to a second doctor after a surgical abortion, and that doctor reported to police he believed an abortion had been performed. The patient testified against Brad and Ristel, and Ristel was convicted and sentenced to a year in prison. On release, she claimed she would no longer offer surgical abortions, only providing pills and running her boarding house, which was still a lucrative and thriving business for her. In March of 1873, Anthony Comstock was appointed as a special agent of the United States Postal Services, following passage of a federal law he helped to write that made it a crime punishable by up to five years in prison to use the United States Postal Service for, quote, obscene purposes. The full description of what would fall under the jurisdiction of this law is as follows. Quote, Every obscene, lewd, or lascivious, and every filthy book, pamphlet, picture, paper, letter, writing, print or other publication of an indecent character, 
and every article or thing designed, adapted, or intended for preventing conception or producing abortion or for any indecent or immoral use, and every article, instrument, substance, drug, medicine, or thing which is advertised or described in a manner calculated to lead another to use it or apply it for presenting conception or producing abortion or for any indecent or immoral purpose, and every written or printed card, letter, circular, book, pamphlet, advertisement, or notice of any kind giving information directly or indirectly where or how or of whom or by what means any of the here and before mentioned matters, articles, or things may be obtained or made, or where or by whom any act or operation of any kind for the procurement or producing of abortion will be done or performed, or how or by what means conception may be prevented or abortion may be produced, whether sealed or unsealed, and every letter, packet or package, or other mail matter containing any filthy, vile or indecent thing, device, or substance, and every paper, writing, advertisement, or representation that any article, instrument, substance, drug, medicine, or thing may or can be used or applied for preventing inception or producing abortion, or for any indecent or immoral purpose, and every description calculated to induce or incite a person to so use or apply such an article, instrument, substance, drug, medicine, or thing is hereby declared to be a non-mailable matter and shall not be conveyed in the mails or delivered to any post office by any letter carrier. Whoever shall knowingly deposit or cause to be deposited for mailing or delivery anything declared in this section to be non-mailable or shall knowingly take or cause the same to be taken from the mails for the purpose of circulating or disposing thereof or of aiding in circulation of the disposition thereof shall be fined not more than $5,000 or imprisoned not more than five years or both. In May of that same year, along with members of the YMCA, Comstock founded the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. The New York Times said the organization would fail because, quote, widely read newspapers can flaunt criminal advertisements or purient or sensuous descriptions and accounts of the proceedings of the divorce courts and other nastiness before their readers, not only unpunished, but with the moral support of oftentimes respectable religious families that patronize them. But Comstock had made this his personal mission in life. In 1878, Comstock went to one of the Madame Stell offices, claiming to be a married man whose wife had given him too many children. He claimed to be concerned for her health and asked for Vestel's assistance. She sold him her standard pills, and the next day Comstock returned with a police officer to arrest her. Vestel said in the press that she intended to fight the charges, as she had in the past, believing that she was being unfairly targeted. She said to the press, quote, There are a number of little doctors who are in the same business behind him. They think if they can get me in trouble and out of the way, they can make a fortune. If the public are determined to push this matter, they will have a good laugh when they learn the nature of the terrible items of preventative prescriptions. Of course, if there's a trial, it will all come out. In private, however, it was quite different. Those who worked for her reported that she paced back and forth in her home, in tears, saying, Why did they persecute me so? I have done nothing to harm anyone. On April 1, 1878, Anne Lohman, the woman known as Madame Restelle, was found dead in her bathtub after committing suicide by slitting her own throat. This having occurred on April Fool's Day, Comstock, when he was first told, believed it was a tasteless joke. But on confirmation, he reportedly reached for the file on Lohman and wrote, A Bloody Ending to a Bloody Life. Comstock continued to actively enforce what came to be known as the Comstock Laws. His interpretation of obscene, lewd, or lascivious was so broad that some medical anatomy textbooks were unable to be sent by mail to medical students. In 1899, Comstock filed charges against an Ida Craddock after her book on human sexuality was featured in the Chicago Clinic Medical Journal, which led it to have a growing popularity and be distributed through the mail. She received a suspended sentence, but in 1902, she was once again charged for another book and was sentenced to three months in prison. Almost immediately on her release, Comstock charged her a third time for a third book, and during the trial, the judge ruled the book was so, quote, obscene, lewd, lascivious, and dirty that the jury would not be allowed to read it. When she was sentenced to five years in prison as a result, Craddock slashed her wrist while inhaling natural gas from her oven, leaving a suicide note blaming Comstock. During his time in office, Comstock burned at least 15 tons of books, nearly 4,000 pictures, and over 200 pounds of printing plates he claimed were used for, quote, objectionable books. 
Comstock bragged that he had not only arrested 4,000 people during his time in service, but by his count, he had driven 15 people to suicide in his, quote, fight for the young. In 1965, Greenwald v. Connecticut was presented to the Supreme Court, examining a Connecticut state law that prohibited any person from using, quote, any drug, medicinal article, or instrument for the purpose of preventing conception. The court ruled that although the Bill of Rights does not give explicit right to privacy, that it was implied by their provisions. Writing for the majority, Justice Arthur Goldberg wrote, quote, Would we allow the police to search the sacred precincts of marital bedrooms for telltale signs of the use of contraceptives? The very idea is repulsive to the notion of privacy surrounding the marriage relationship. In 1972, the court expanded this right to privacy to unmarried couples. And this right to privacy was not only the basis of the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, but this finding was the basis of the 2003 ruling in Lawrence v. Texas regarding homosexuality, where the court declared, quote, Texas statute furthers no legitimate state interest which can justify its intrusion into the personal and private life of the individual. This right to privacy was also a large part of the basis for a Bergefell v. Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage. However, these decisions did not repeal the Comstock laws. In fact, during a recent oral argument on if the drug mifepristone could continue to be distributed by mail based on the FDA approving its safety, both Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito asked the attorneys if they considered how the Comstock laws would apply. Justice Thomas' specific question was, quote, So how do you respond to an argument that mailing your product and advertising it would violate the Comstock Act? The attorney seeking to allow the ban responded, quote, With respect to the Comstock Act as relevant here, the Comptact Act says the drug should not be mailed through the either through the mail or through common carriers, so we think the plain text of that, Your Honor, is pretty clear. History is awkward.